And I think it's easy for a company to say it's personalized because what does that mean, right? It might mean you can pick red, white, or mixed. I guess that's personalized. But for us, we sent out over 120,000 boxes of wine last month, and more than 100,000 of those were entirely unique combinations to that person. Welcome, everybody. I'm Mark Peter Davis, Managing Partner of Interplay Ventures. On this podcast, I chat with innovators, VCs, and entrepreneurs about their industries, careers, and decisions. Today, we have a very special guest, Philip James, who is without a question one of the most prolific wine entrepreneurs in the country, maybe of all time. He's launched a number of companies in his, over his career and has raised tens of millions of dollars for some of America's top venture capital firms. His current company, First Leaf, has been a huge success and delivers personalized wine to over 100,000 subscribers every month. He's going to share terrific business insights. He's going to teach us about the three-tier alcohol system. And he takes us through a journey of his younger years when he helped save someone's life on the top of Mount Everest. He's absolutely brilliant. I hope you enjoy the conversation. This episode is brought to you by Fire on Marketing. Fire on Marketing is a full service marketing firm providing high quality cost effective solutions. They support companies in developing websites, creating content, email marketing, optimizing SEO, and managing ad campaigns on social media, Google, and beyond. What's unique about their approach is that they connect all of the marketing activities together to create a unified conversion loop and generate higher yield for clients. If you're interested in learning more, visit fireonmarketing.com. Would you mind quickly running us through a couple of the companies you had started before this, just the headlines, kind of how they played in the space, what different problems they were solving, and then how you arrived at your current venture and what you do? Uh, yeah, happy to. So, you know, I think, <clears throat> so there's always a, when you tell the story with the benefit of hindsight that you like thread it as if it was a foregone conclusion. And right. before I give it to you, None of this was a foregone conclusion for me. But in hindsight, you can draw this thread that shows how, in all cases, we, we stayed adjacent to the customer, but in all cases, we moved gradually up the value chain as I figured out how to do the piece, the next piece behind the scenes. And so, so I had worked for somebody else, uh, another company called Wine Messenger, for a couple of years after business school. Um, and what I realized there was how difficult it was to find out there was, no, there was no IMDB, right? There was no standard database of wine information. And, and we were selling wine that, that were relatively unknown in the US. We were the sole importer, um, uh, the sole retailer in the United States. And it was an immense amount of work to get these often not English speaking small growers around Europe and, and around the rest of the world to, t to give us high quality photography, to give us winemakers notes, right? To tell us the acidity level and all of these things. And I, I, my simple realization was if it's difficult for us, it must be difficult for everybody else. Right. And so the first company I left and started called Snooth, still around today, um, it's actually run by my, uh, my co-founder. So I was the original CEO, he was the CTO, uh, and now he's CTO and CEO. And, um, and really, it was an information aggregator of wine content, wine reviews, um, pricing. Uh, we were ad supported or are ad supported as well as like lead generation for wineries and retailers. Um, but gradually, what I realized there was we were only getting paid, you know, 30 cents a click or 50 cents a click. And maybe the merchant was selling the product for $150 for, a, you know, for a box of wine. Um, but customers would blame us if there was an issue with the merchant, right? Because if you originate with a, but I would do that too. If I book through Expedia, yeah. if I'm upset, I blame Expedia, even if they have no control over well, how And nice you also get, didn't you give them a score? Were you recommending them at some level? You, uh, there was a, yeah, there was a ranking system for the- Right, so if someone's got a 90 something and it sucks, right. I'm going to be mad at you. And, and, and so one of the, so- Online wine has a number of challenges. So state regulations, you know, you, you get to the end of trying to check out and the store says, we don't have it in stock or we can't ship to your state or no problem, but there's a $50 shipping fee, right? So there's a lot of gotchas that can happen. <laughs> um, and so, so that was 2007 or 2006 till 2010. Uh, and then 
uh, one of the uh, advisory board members from Snooth and myself co-founded Lot 18. Uh, and, and Lot 18 was, we're like, okay, people need help finding the wine they want or, or finding a good wine or they need someone to help them you know, understand which wines might be good for them. And so Lot 18 was a flash sale retailer, but we were still partnering with other wineries uh, to make the wine. And we were often partnering. We, we, in some cases, those wineries would put their product in a central warehouse, but in a lot of cases they wouldn't and they would still do the shipping themselves. And <clears throat> that business raised a lot of money and grew quickly. Um, we sold... You had, you had big investors. Excel was mm-hmm. in, right? This is, this uh, is Excel, a big... Excel a big story and in NEA. New York. Yeah, Excel and NEA. Uh, yeah, we went, I mean, we went from zero to $25 million in sales in 14 months. Wow. Uh, wow. Yes, we grew quickly. Yeah, so we had, you know, but the, I have learned that lesson. And, and I've seen friends and, and other entrepreneurs kind of go through this too, that the hotter your company is on the way up, the more people want to like uh, destroy it on the way down. And so... Business Insider loved to write about us and, you know, everybody else did too. Uh, but the moment that there was a layoff or a misstep or we missed the forecast, then everybody enjoyed writing about it on the flip side too. Um, anyway, and so, so Lottie Teen had big investors. We grew quickly. Um, and this was the era of Groupon and guilt, right? And mm-hmm. it was flash sale frenzy. And, you know, where a lot of those didn't end up very well, right? And, and so Groupon went public, but I'm not actually sure now what happened to Ideally or Living Social or, you know, and there were 700 others behind that too. Right. Um, but Lot 18 sold wine. <clears throat> we also sold some specialty food, um, some cooking equipment and, you know, a few adjacent categories, but wine was the core. But again, I realized that we, so we were the front end, right? We were the website, the email, the marketing, the customer service, the customer would interact through us, but we were still beholden to perhaps this boutique winery and their shipping capacity. And I remember one day we had a bonanza sale. <clears throat> we sold, I don't know, a year's worth of this winery's inventory. They were so incredibly happy. And then the next day, the winemaker or the owner phoned us up and said, FedEx cannot make it up my bumpy driveway. I have to put the wine in the back of my you know, pickup truck and I have to carry it down to the FedEx depot. However, you sold whatever, 2000 cases and I have an injured dog, so I can only make one trip a day. And so it's going to take me six weeks to get the wine down to the FedEx depot. And we're like, hang on, we just spent tens of thousands of dollars on customer acquisition. And now we have to write to them and say it's going to be up to two months for delivery. Wow. Um, and so kind of step by step by step, I said, to build the business I want, we have to take on yet another piece of the value chain. And so eventually we get to... Uh, to Penrose Hill and to First Leaf. And so we are, and this is my kind of, the, hopefully the only buzzword sentence, buzzword laden sentence. We are a direct to consumer asset light wine company. And I say wine company because, well, we are a winery. We actually have more than one winery license. We have one in Napa, we have one in Sonoma, but we're also an importer uh, and we import wine that our winemakers blend and make. And we, we make that wine now across more than a dozen countries, 75 different brands that we've created, uh, 250 different SKUs. And, and what we do well uh, is how we incorporate all of the user feedback into that product creation. Uh, and it's allowed us to get, I think, something like 1,700 awards for our wines now. Uh, and kind of nobody believes us. So we publish them all on the website. Um, uh, but ultimately it's a, you know, it's a vertically integrated business, which means we do the work of the importer. We do the work of certainly the winery and ultimately retailing it direct to consumer. Um, we own the margin of those people, uh, of those, you know, of those tiers. Uh, and it means that we can pass a lot of that value back to the consumer, right? So, so at the price we charge, the customer is getting a great wine, a great value, but also kind of incorporated in that very data, uh, you know, sort of data first uh, model is, is just how personalized uh, the service can be. And so it is a version of a wine club. I think it's a very 21st century version. Um, we have a, now we have a data science team. We have multiple 
granted patents and pending patents. Uh, now, 20 years later, my master's thesis in mass spectroscopy is very useful. Um, <laughs> we have a, <clears throat> a we have a six figure spectroscopy machine in our lab, um, and and you know I think the algorithm runs on without joke. It's a number that I don't even understand how many zeros are in it. I believe it runs on more than a septillion data points, right? Which mm. I, is 21 zeros or 24 zeros. It's this Sounds crazy impressive. piece of AI machine learning. And it's, right. it's the core of what we do. But it means that every single person is in a unique track, right? Like, like, like Pandora that, Radio. So, yeah, so exp explain that. So someone comes onto the service and they say they want wine. How do you figure out what's right for them? And can you take me through the journey? Yeah, sure. So we, so we, we ask people a, a relatively simple set of questions at first. And, and so you, do, you, do you know any of these wine brands? Do you know if you like these styles of wine? Um, we ask them some questions that help us figure out, you know, what your sensitivity to sugar or tannin might be. So nuts have a lot of tannin in them. Uh, if you have your coffee black is different than if you have it like a unicorn frappuccino. Um, and so it helps us understand at least like the guardrails of what you might like. And the, and, and I think that's 12 questions and I don't know, there's some billions of combinations that would just automatically come out of that. We'll make a recommendation for your first box. We sell the first box at a very, you know, attractive introductory price. Um, but thereafter we incorporate everything that we can, you know, either the customer's review, <clears throat> the, the ratings, whether they're buying, swapping, reordering, and so on. Um, but we also, we now get, I think it's 85,000 inbound phone calls and emails a week from customers. It's like some, some massive number. Um, and people, the long tail of people's tastes is just miraculous, right? And so, <clears throat> yes, a lot of people like red wine. Yes, a lot of people like California wine. But you get past that and you get to people that are like, I don't want French wine because 10 years ago, the US and France had an argument and freedom fries. And someone will say, I need to know how much alcohol is in the wine. And we're thinking low alcohol. And they say, no, I want higher alcohol because I want good bang for my buck. And then someone might say, I just don't want a wine with an animal on the front because I'm, I'm an adult and I'm going to serve it to guests and I want it to at least look sophisticated um, and all kinds of things in between, right? This burnt my throat, upset my stomach. And, and we, all of our customer service uh, uh, MX reps are professionally trained, you know, wine and spirits education trust representatives. And, <clears throat> and it's easy for me if, if you drink, if I see you taste half a dozen wines and you talk about them, I can translate that back into, into what chemistry is, you like and don't like, right? Is it tannin? Is it glycerol? Is it emollients? Is it alcohol content, right? Is it acidity? Um, but nobody is, nobody, normal people are not trained to do that, right? Like we see blue, but a designer will see turquoise or cerulean or whatever those colors are. I'm colorblind, so I can't see any of them. Um, but anyway, and so, there is clearly a, you know, like lingua franca in the wine industry and only trained wine people would know it. And so what we do is we help deduce that for the customer. Um, and it means ultimately that every single person uh, gets a unique track, right? So the wines that go into their box are unique for that customer. And, <clears throat> and, and I think it's easy for a company to say it's personalized because what does that mean, right? It might mean you can pick red, white, or mixed. I guess that's personalized. But for us, we sent out over 120,000 boxes of wine last month, and more than 100,000 of those were entirely unique combinations to that person. Huh. So that's a nightmare of packing in the warehouse, um, but huge in terms of customer satisfaction and retention. So it's a wine club using data science to completely customize what people get. Well, yes, but that data science also goes back to the winemakers, so they so they know how to source and make a wine uh, for the various kind of clusters of consumer taste. But you're not you're not doing the agriculture. You're not growing the grapes and everything. You're you're sourcing and putting it all together. Yeah. So we we will sometimes buy grapes and and crush and ferment. Um, but in general, we're partnering with other vineyards. Uh, and remember, we make wine in 12 countries, right? So that is across Europe, 
South America, South, uh, it, South do Africa. Do you own those vineyards or hmm. are they? No, no, no. So no, those partners? are, those are partner wineries. And right. Yeah. And, and they could be, some of them are large companies. Some of them are multi-generational family businesses. Um, and our winemakers, we have three winemakers that are, that work in our lab every day. Um, we have our own, our own tank storage. Like there's a winery in Napa. It doesn't have a tasting room. So customers don't really visit. Um, but our winemakers will work with the growers, right? The, and so something that a lot of people don't realize is the wine industry is, is a lot more like disaggregated than you think. Because if I say winery, you're imagining an estate. You're imagining a house on a hill right. with the vineyard out front. But very little wine is what is called a state grown. And if it is a state grown, you would know because it would say a state on the label. And it's a protected term. Um, huh. And so, you, so people are showing up at the winery mm -hmm. and what they're tasting was not grown on the property? If it's a state, they will tell you, right? If you... If but mo go pick more up, often than not, the tourists are coming through and it, it, are what they drink is what they're drinking something that wasn't made there. I feel you, like you're, usually, you're holding usually, back here on some truth. <clears throat> no, no, no. So actually in two dimensions, across two totally different dimensions, it probably wasn't made there. First of all, it probably was not grown there. And secondly, it was probably not made there. Now wow. there are exceptions. And if your wine says a state on it, right, because it's a legally defined term. Estate means the, the fermentation facility, the vineyard have to be contiguous, right? That's a nice, very clear definition, all right? right. The grapes are here and the factory or whatever you want to call it, the bottling line, the tanks is there. Right. And, and <clears throat> there, are, there are estate wines, but they would usually say estate grown or something on the front label because it's a very rare, I, I don't know the percentage, but I, I think it's, single digit percent of wine sold in America as a state. Um, now, I think if you go to the tasting room, those are usually more boutique, uh, boutique wineries. And, and some of those will be a state. But remember that most people who buy wine would buy it in a liquor store or a grocery store, right? Most people right. are not going to Napa and drinking the wine. And also the average Napa wine is $50 or $75. And they might be a state, but a lot of them still are not. Um, but if you pick up a bottle of, you know, pick your brand, if you pick up a bottle of anything in a grocery store, if it is a state grown, it's going to tell you because it's a powerful piece of marketing. So why would you omit it? Um, <clears throat> and so, so most, so generally what happens is there are growers, those are farmers, right? They farm grapes instead of almonds or something else. And then most wineries are not big enough to own their own facility. And so there are, we work type shared facilities, which we would, I would call a custom crush. And so often the grower will sell to uh, the custom crush who will make the wine to spec for the winery, which is <clears throat> in many cases kind of a marketing and branding company. And, Interesting. and that's how a lot of wine is made. And the wine industry doesn't want to talk about that. Right. And because it's, it's doesn't sound very romantic. Yeah. And, <clears throat> there, there seems and to be so, some mystique, right? <clears throat> There's folks out there who take a, quite a lot of pride in being wine connoisseurs and being able to put on a show at dinner. How much of that is real versus that they're the victims of marketing, right? Is there, you know, you're, you're creating customized alcohol for people's completely different palates. Is there a good wine? Is there a bad wine? Are people getting ripped off on some pricing? How do you, when you look at this as a guy who's inside the industry, is it a joke? When you see the guy putting his nose super deep in the glass in the middle of the restaurant, is that real? It's, it's all of the above. Right. And so I, if you, I'm trying to think of what the right analogy is. Let's think of music, right? There are manufactured pop bands, right? That the, they audition and they put the participants together and they didn't know each other until they started singing together, right? Right. I, I guess, I guess that's fake, I guess, right? But it, the music might be nice. Um, it's just probably not written by the people who sing it. And clearly at the other extreme, there are, 
there are singer songwriters who tour on their own and they're as authentic as they come and and there's everything in the middle and so the wine industry has that too there are absolutely estate wineries they'll probably say it on the label there are <clears throat> there are possibly still wineries where they squash the grapes by feet maybe um <laughs> but on the other extreme there are four or five large conglomerate wine alcohol businesses in america giant public companies typically and they control three quarters of the revenue of the wine category and so <clears throat> all under a bunch know, of different brands right different labels hundreds, you, hundreds you, of you brands have no idea you're buying from the same guy <clears throat> hundreds of brands thousand SKUs, and and so i don't know yes i know a lot of fancy wine collectors and you're right they, they bury their nose in the glass and and i think some of them are genuinely buying wine that's multi-generational that's organic that's that's terroir from the place that's estate grown and traditional and all those are true but it's a very small percentage of the industry and <clears throat> don't forget that wine is sold in grocery stores right and so right for, for every collector there are 99 consumers right and and for a lot of people that yes aisle one you have vegetables and aisle four you have pringles and in aisle seven you have wine and and we we all like wine but wine is, is only an art form to some people, right? right? Like it shouldn't be an art form to everybody. And that's, I think that's totally okay. Like I like wine. I like how it tastes. I, <clears throat> I like the sociability of it. There's a lot I like about wine, but I'm not a wine collector. And, and I like that I'm not a wine collector. Um, and I think it helps, you know, me and my team are generally not. And I think it helps kind of remind us to be real that, to a lot of consumers, it's not a collectible product either. To a lot of people, they buy a bottle and then they drink a bottle and then they buy a second bottle and later they'll drink the second bottle. Right. That's different than having 4,000 bottles. Or they buy two bottles. and drink two. It's a separate issue. But that's different than having 4,000 bottles in a cellar and yes. building a collection. Like, I don't know, you can use stamp to send mail or you can use stamp to put in a book and look at. Right. Thank you. That is very helpful. Uh, talking about the complexity, you talked about in the Snoot days, earlier in this discussion about dealing with selling across state lines. I think a lot of people don't have a lot of familiarity with the three tier alcohol system. Would you mind giving kind of the, the quick one-on-one on that? And um, I'd love to hear your take on whether you think that should remain, should be changed, et cetera. Yeah. It's hard to give a quick take, but so <clears throat> It's because the problem is I have to begin this with, we have to go all the way back to prohibition. So the repeal of prohibition, I think this is kind of, an, as, as an American now, I think this is a very interesting stat. The repeal of prohibition is the only time when an amendment has repealed a prior amendment. Right? Which I think is very interesting. Amendments amend, yeah. right? They adjust. But the repeal of prohibition removed or struck down entirely a former amendment and <clears throat> anyway and that happened oh man i'm sort of bad with my dates but let's say 70 years ago or something right like 1930 1940 what's that 90 years ago so it was a long time ago and and the you get into like why why was there prohibition what was the point of it it was there was organized crime there were all of these this is al capone right there were there was a lot of challenges that prohibition was trying to solve and then the repeal of prohibition itself but what it meant was that the states get to choose how they regulate the flow of alcohol within their own borders and the states then created the three-tier system producers sell to distributors who sell to retailers and in you know, now i have to compress 70 years right there's 70 years and two or more at least two supreme court case rulings in here and one of them was in 2019 so this is happening like right now, right? This is still changing. Uh, and in fact, it was yesterday uh, that we began to ship direct to consumer Kentucky. And six months ago, if we ship to the consumer in Kentucky, it's what's called a felony state, right? That like, not only are we not allowed to, that it would directly be a felony for me as an officer of the company to have allowed it to occur. Wow. But now Kentucky has a license and we're one of the first, you know, 10 or 20 wineries to be actively and legally, of course, selling to consumers in Kentucky. And so the repeal of prohibition <clears throat> has created this patchwork of federal laws and state laws, and none of them agree with each other. It's incredibly complicated. We, we've had a full-time compliance uh, employee um, 
for years. And I, I was thinking about this earlier. I'm sure we spend millions of dollars a year on compliance costs. And <clears throat> I feel like barriers to entry are a moat, right? Where if you're crossing the moat, it's a nightmare. But when you've crossed the moat, you're, you know, you're like, wow, it's, it's, a, it's a defense now against competition. But it definitely adds cost and complexity to the consumer. And I think that's what's unfair, right? It's if a consumer finds a wine they like and they go online and they see a store, like you just assume you can order it, right? And you don't realize that that store may not legally be allowed to sell it to you, uh, even though that store may only be 50 miles away, right? You could be in New York, they could be in New Jersey, and they may not, depending on their license, be allowed to ship it to you. Uh, and, and I think that's very, very difficult now that so many of the sales are online right, where that geographic distance isn't relevant to the consumer, right? In, in, a, in a real world, it didn't matter because you went to the store, right? And you pick it up in person. Um, but yeah, I think people don't realize if you, if you buy a bottle of wine in one state and you drive across the state line, in some states, that's illegal, right? And obviously, it's very difficult to enforce and so on. But the three-tier system, which does have these protections, I think it does it at a cost of like consumer accessibility. What's the benefit of it? Why, why do we need this? At this point, we're, Capone's long gone. Yeah. I don't know all the rationale back then. Is there any benefit to the three-tier system at this point in the game? There, that is a complicated and much debated question. Um, the, the Supreme Court on down agree with the legitimacy of the three-tier system. And they say that very clearly. <clears throat> but what they don't agree with, and I, what I find particularly unfair, is, is when they're, or anti-consumer, is when there are laws that, that treat um, an in and out of state entity differently. So some states will say wineries within the state can ship, but wineries from out of state cannot ship. And those protectionist laws are the ones that are being struck down at the moment, very, very, very quickly. Um, and so since, since the starting of Penrose Hill, Pennsylvania, Oklahoma, and now Kentucky have all been made legal, right? I mean, that's, that's three states in four years, right? That's, that's, that's meaningful. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, many dozens of other laws have relaxed somewhat, right? The, maybe there was a quantity limit. There are states that say you can only buy one case of wine every three months if you buy it online, right? And you're like, really? Like, that's the limit? Like, that's one bottle of wine a week. Like, what happens if you live in a house with more than one person or enjoy wine more than once a week? That, that, it's not like it's a case a day, right? And right. so how, how can the limit be justifiably set there when in a liquor store, I can fill up a shopping cart of vodka and nobody would stop <laughs> me? And, <clears throat> and so there are definitely protectionist laws and those are getting struck down. But I think generally the three-tier system will always exist, but hopefully it will exist where the remaining laws are fair. Okay, so can you take us through the story of how you landed doing wine? I've heard a narrative of this where you weave together your education and it just makes sense on the outside. Is that actually the story? How did you end up being in, you know, the wine guy? So <clears throat> how did I get into the wine industry? So I... I grew up in England. I, I worked in London. I worked for an American investment bank. And at least for those who did it, right, three years in banking or three years in consultancy. And then the bank says, we're an American company. You should go to an American business school. Um, <clears throat> and and um, I was lucky enough to be accepted to, uh, to Columbia Business School. Um, actually, a little known fact <clears throat> is I, I can't remember now if I applied to five or six uh, schools, but I was I was immediately rejected from all of them but one, um, and Columbia put me on their wait list. Um, <clears throat> and then and I was the smart one that took you. Well, I was on Everest at the time, and I was like, I don't if if I don't get into one school, I'm not sure what I'm going to do next. Right? right? Like at least the I'm going to business school next is a way to defer having to look for a job for two years. And right. so <clears throat> and so on a satellite phone from twenty four thousand feet. You know, I took the oxygen mask off and I phoned the admissions office and I said, please let me in. You know, I'm on Everest and I will absolutely accept. Um, and I know business schools, they like to keep the, whatever, that ratio between 
offers extended and offers accepted. Yes. And so at least, hey, I have no alternatives. Right. Um, I'm desperate. <clears throat> Let me in. You're a good yes. candidate for them. So at least that worked. Um, anyway, and so <clears throat> certainly by the time I went to business school, I knew I wanted to start a business. But I feel like that's the wrong, the wrong way to become an entrepreneur, right? The entrepreneur with no good ideas is not a very good entrepreneur. And, <clears throat> and off the back of the traveling and adventures, um, no surprise, I thought, why don't I have an adventure travel company? That is a, not a very scalable idea uh, if I have to go lead the trips myself. Um, but <clears throat> back then, me and a friend had an idea and, and began to, to create this company. Um, we didn't get very far. We didn't raise money. Um, uh, for me, ultimately, my immigration lawyer said, you just, it's not credible that you self-sponsor for a visa, right? Like that just looks too, too sneaky. It's just you and your buddy, <clears throat> you don't right. have investors. Right. He was like, that, that doesn't sound like something that's going to work. Um, and at the same time, uh, uh, a friend of mine from business school, um, his father ran a, a wine importer and wine <clears throat> on online catalog retailer. And my friend's father was sick. He actually um, uh, had early onset Alzheimer's. Oh. Um, and so the family, yeah, I think he was mid 60s. So, <clears throat> you know, so still pretty Very young. Early. Um, yeah. And so the family was trying to transition him out of the business, it, you know, family owned company. The, my friend, the son, was, was taking over. And <clears throat> my friend knew wine. And didn't know business. By the way, not that I knew business, but at least I knew how to do a financial model and and those kinds of things. And so my friend said, "Come work here. We'll get you the visa. <clears throat> and then when you've helped me stabilize and turn the business around, you can go do whatever you want." Um, and you know that absolutely was a trial by fire for me. And it's a huge change from. <clears throat> You know, no matter how good your Excel modeling skills are, right? You can build a financial model for a business, but then you show up and you're in like, you know, a dusty warehouse in Yonkers, and um, <clears throat> and 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 the guys who are packing the boxes have like flick knives in their pocket, right? And I walk in and I'm like, "Hi, I'm the guy from England," and you know, let's talk about you know on time shipping percentage. Um, <clears throat> And so all of that kind of fell with a thud and very, very quickly, I had to realize that, you know, this, this line on the P and L actually was me phoning up Xerox to get somebody to come fix the printer. Right. And so there's like a gritty reality of business that if you're a consultant or certainly if you're a, a banker, you just don't see, right. You read the annual report, you build the financial model, you have a presentation, maybe you do the M and A or the corporate finance, but <clears throat> but, but, you know, getting into the, what the numbers actually represent, uh, and certainly the people in the business was just so, <clears throat> so instructive for me, um, that I ended up loving the wine industry and I did end up with a business idea and I did end up starting a business, but, you know, I think I, not I, the way you expected. Yeah. It, it wasn't adventure travel. And, you know, from there on, I've been in, wine and wine commerce. And, you know, it's been like that since 2005. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. You studied chemistry at Oxford under, undergrad. Is that right? Uh, you know, and yes. And <clears throat> I had this narrative in my head that you were always a wine guy. You studied chemistry in Oxford. You knew what you were doing. You got training at Columbia and then you went out and did it. Not that straightforward. Well, maybe when you finished editing, it will be that straightforward. <laughs> um, no, it, no, it wasn't, right? And there's a lot of accident and luck and all of those things. And it is ironic because <clears throat> for at least 10 years, I didn't think about chemistry. And maybe the advantage of a, a STEM degree is that, you know, you're good at math, you're good at logic, right? And so you can do other things, right? Because a lot of business is that, right? If you can, if you're good with numbers, you can build a financial model, right? You don't need to know gap accounting to build the model, right. but you need to be good in Excel. Um, <clears throat> so there were certainly things I used, um, but I have to say that now, and now it's different because, um, you know, we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about it, but I, I've started different wine companies, but this is the only time we're making the wine. Uh, and so now suddenly the chemistry degree is useful and even more so, um, 
I actually have a master's degree in chemistry. My master's thesis was in using mass spectroscopy. So you want me to nerd out for a second? <clears throat> Please. Back, back then was using a mass spectroscopy machine uh, in order to help uh, uh, an Oxford University spin out, <clears throat> uh, uh, you know, startup. It was to help them find the blue compound that would be used in organic light emitting diodes. So OLEDs, right? And so it's fascinating to me that, you know, 15, 15 or no, 20 years later, sorry, that was 1999. So 20 years later, right, you can buy an OLED TV. I'm pretty sure my phone screen is OLED. <clears throat> and I was a researcher seconded to a startup trying to find a blue compound for an OLED. We didn't do it. Uh, I think some, some entirely different company. You know, has that been helpful to you in winemaking? Well, and so it has now because <clears throat> over the past few years, we've gone from making the wine to actually now um, running our entire laboratory in-house. I see. And so last so they, year, we bought a, a mass spectroscopy machine. It's actually an infrared spectroscopy. It's come full circle. And so stunningly enough, we're now doing uh, like predictive recommendations based on the spectroscopy data of the wine. And I get to fall back on my master's research project. And it only Amazing. took 20 years. Amazing. It paid off. I mentioned to someone recently that I was having one of the country's foremost wine entrepreneurs on the show. And they asked if it was Gary Vee. Oh. And Gary Vee, obviously, he's made a huge name for himself. He's very successful. Um, and I was, it hadn't even occurred to me because I see him in such a different light. I know he started out in the wine side, but he's grown to be so much beyond that. Do you, do you see Gary Vee in your world? Is he in your orbit? Is he, where, where does he sit? Does that come up often? It, I think I have the same, <clears throat> the same answer that you just gave, right? But I have a funny anecdote about that because, yeah, I see him now as a, I don't know, well, social media maven, book author, and <clears throat> giant consulting running businessman, right? And he, he is still in the wine industry, but it doesn't and almost seem like a me. motivational speaker on top of it. Yeah, so sure, all of that stuff. But <clears throat> this is a quote I hear, I've heard that Gary said, um, <clears throat> but he's never said it to me, so this is an indirect quote. He said something like, he's invested in three wine businesses in his life, and two of them were started by Philip James. And so I, I don't know if that's, to well, he did invest in this business and one other. So that is true. One, uh, another business that I was a co-founder of. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not 100% sure. I didn't hear with my own ears that he said yeah. that, but I love that quote. And so I'm very grateful to him for saying that, if yeah. true. Um, <clears throat> but he is an investor uh, in Penrose Hill, and he was an investor um, uh, in the previous company that I was co-founder of. But you're right that generally I don't bump into him in a wine context. Yeah, I think he's transcended. I think he started there as a family business and then it's just, he's moved to a different game. Okay, that's a good transition. You're not only one of the most prolific wine entrepreneurs in America, you started three companies in the space. You raised over $100 million at this point, I presume. But what's more interesting about you is you remind me of the world's most interesting man from the Dos Equis commercial. You familiar with that? You're laughing. Uh, I am, I'm familiar with that. I don't yeah. feel as, uh, as interesting anymore, but okay, thank you. Okay, right. Well, you've lived real life adventures. Can you tell us a little bit about climbing Mount Everest? Uh, I can. I spent, <clears throat> I spent more than two months um, camped out on the side of Everest uh, as part of a six-person expedition to summit via the North Face uh, back in 2003. Right, so a long time ago now, right? So, you know, I was in my early 20s back then. And I think if I had summited, I would have been the youngest British person to do so. But that record, you know, has been come and gone and broken many times since then. Um, uh, but ultimately, it ended up becoming a, a rescue mission. Uh, my, my, one of the six people in the team, my climbing partner, fell and broke his leg on the summit day. Oh my God. Uh, I was further down the mountain at the time. Um, but <clears throat> over... Over a five-day period, first the people who were right with him, and then all of us helped, you know, drag him, carry him, call in help, barter, you know, get, you know, barter and trade and get people to, to help where possible. Um, it's pretty difficult up there, right? There's not a lot of, nobody has any spare capacity. 
right? No, nobody has any spare capacity for, for exertion. Nobody has any spare food or oxygen. Um, so it was quite, uh, quite a, you know, quite an epic ordeal. Uh, I mean, the guy who, who broke his leg ended up having multiple surgeries, um, you know, pins in his leg. Uh, a lot of it was, was him <clears throat> just kind of, uh, sliding on his hip and, you know, plant the ice axe in the ground and, you know, kind of do a pull up to drag your body forward 30 centimeters and then do it again. Wow. And, you know, people can barely climb Everest, right? People can barely walk and climb up the side right. of it. The but sounds imagine, Herculean. imagine crawling, uh, down it. And, <clears throat> um, uh, and one of our team actually lost the tips of three fingers to frostbite, like directly from helping from taking his gloves off, helping, uh, Conan, the guy who broke his leg, helping him change his oxygen cylinders, um, yeah, it was, um, <clears throat> feel, feels very far away. I didn't realize the Everest story was a kind of a tragic one. I mean, it sounds like it worked out. You know, you, you dropped it very confidently. Yeah, I climbed Everest, no big deal back in the day. If you Google, so the, the guy is called Conan Harrod, C-O-N-A-N, Harrod, like Harrod store. Um, we'll, we'll link <clears throat> in the show notes to this guy. Yeah, and, and I mean... It was him above all else, right? He's the guy who fell. He's the guy that had to, and I think the, the BBC article is like down Everest on his knees, right? Yeah. But like, he's the guy who crawled. Everybody else played a supporting role to, to a very yeah, sure, degree. But, but, <clears throat> but everybody else would have, would have lain down and died. And <clears throat> um, I remember, so I wasn't there, remember, I wasn't there when he fell, but he told me and, and the people who were there told me that, <clears throat> Soon after he fell, so he falls, he's like screaming in agony. The, the, the climber on our team who was right next to him radios us in, in like a total screaming panic. And, but days later, they told me that two well, like famous climbers, people that I'd read about, people I'd read books written by, right? Two famous climbers walked past and said to the non-injured guy, leave him the poor bastard is dead already and so wow not only did you did the guy fall and is in immense pain but like your childhood hero says don't even try wow <clears throat> and so so conan deserves this just i can't imagine a more stubborn human <laughs> but like it's not your only adventure Can you tell us about the motorcycle ride <clears throat> sure so um <laughs> So yeah, so in 2013, so I was, you know, older now. Uh, that's why I sat on a motorcycle and didn't ride a bicycle. Um, but yeah, I, I bought a motorcycle. I lived in Midtown Manhattan. I bought a motor. I, so I actually bought a an off road BMW motorcycle in the BMW dealership off the you know off the shop floor on like 59th Street. <clears throat> it's 59th Street and 11th Avenue, and. I'm sure I sounded like a total moron because I w walked in and said, I'm looking for a motorcycle to drive around the world on. And the guy rolls his eyes right. and is like, <laughs> you know, this shiny one. And I'm like, does it come in different colors? <laughs> right. Um, <clears throat> I'm greatly indebted to a friend who taught me basic bike maintenance. Uh, he took me on a, I don't know, a, a two or 3,000 mile like off-road, mainly off-road trip um, uh, down through the uh, Appalachian Mountains. And uh, by the summer, I thought I knew what I was doing. Uh, spent a month uh, crossing the U.S. So again, mainly off-road, Appalachians, um, <clears throat> the Continental Divide, so the Rockies. Um, ultimately, took the bike uh, to Vancouver. Uh, got it wrapped in a box, put it on a plane. <clears throat> picked it up in uh, Incheon, uh, Seoul, South Korea. South Korea is small, so crossed in a day. Took a three-day ferry to Vladivostok. Uh, Eastern side or Far East, Russians Far East, and then enough, more than two more months. Uh, I think I was on the bike for over a hundred days. Um, I crossed Siberia, Mongolia, Kazakhstan, and then this was <clears throat> this is wild camping, right? So it's just me with a tent, uh, uh, you know, a stove, some water, and uh, and and by yourself, lot, by myself, and a lot of this. Uh, there are no roads. I mean, there, there are roads in, in Siberia uh, and there are roads in and around the capital city in Mongolia. But you get outside of 
Uh, you get outside of that, and the majority of Mongolia is not paved. It's it's ridiculous. It's basically a giant field. So, Philip, at this point, everyone listening is thinking, okay, this is insane. How does it end? And I know the answer. Yeah, so, well, it ended for me uh, because I crashed in Kazakhstan. Um, <clears throat> and and it's, it was kind of a pathetic way for me to finish because uh, it was near the capital city. It was a paved road, and it was actually where they were doing some construction. And there was like a dip in the road that I didn't see. I mean, I'd been on the right, bike Right, of all the stuff you had been through. Hmm. Yeah. So basically, I crashed in the roadwork section on the outskirts <laughs> of Almaty, Kazakhstan. Um, <clears throat> I ended up having surgery in Kazakhstan, which is another whole story, um, because you actually have to go buy uh, some of your own medicine and equipment and then like give it to the hospital. Uh, and I, you know, with a, I, I broke my collarbone ultimately. And I wasn't sure at the time, but you know, everything hurt. I was worried I had concussion and, and various things. But um, anyway, so I uh, had surgery in Kazakhstan, woke up on the operating table uh, in the middle of the surgery and <clears throat> eventually got back to England and had, so I'm pretty sure if you break your collarbone in the US or England, they put a beautiful anodized custom plate to hold the pieces together. And I'm sure it's a thousand dollar piece of metal. Um, in Kazakhstan, it's a bicycle spoke and they cut it with wire clippers. And so I still have the thing, <laughs> <laughs> the rod that held the, the bones together. Uh, I have it somewhere, somewhere in my uh, trophy. office. Right. So you, you are a lot like the Dos Equis guy. Can we come back to that for a second? You live these crazy adventures. You work in the alcohol industry. Right. There, there are some true parallels here. Okay. So for the entrepreneurs listening, we're trying to figure out what to do next. What does the industry need? What does an industry need? How can they help? So I, I think of what I do or what we do as part of a bigger industry. And so if you start thinking about online grocery, so the, the move online of food and beverage, um, that is an incredibly exciting industry right now. And <clears throat> there's that, 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 what is it? That analogy, uh, not analogy, whatever it's called, the fable, I guess, right? Where if you put a frog in hot water, if you put a frog in water and you heat it up slowly, the frog doesn't realize that it's being boiled. And I feel like online grocery has moved so slowly for so long that nobody really paid attention to, to its rate of change. Um, but last year forced, you know, whether it's five years of adoption or 10 years of adoption in, in just a few months. And I think consumers are not want, consumers will not want to go backwards from there, right? So once, <clears throat> once the grocery store and, and the B2B supply chain is very different than B2C, right? And I remember reading this on a, on a blog post, like Procter & Gamble doesn't sell soap, they sell pallets of soap. Right? That's a very different size and skew and you know, the, the movement of that is very, very different. But now the grocery stores have figured out how to put, how to pack your groceries and put them in the trunk of your car when you wait in the special slot and text them, right? Like, I think it's going to be hard for consumers to get out of your one car to stop surfing the internet and want to go get your own groceries. And now that consumers have seen that it's okay to let the store pick your produce, right? That they don't give you the squashed rotten ones. They give you the right. nice ones, right? Like right. once you've seen that it works, I think it's going to be very difficult to go backwards. And grocery is a trillion dollars. And wow. fine, online grocery used to only be 5%. But that means every, every percent, you know, every 10% every that it moves, right? And it went from 5% to 10% last year. So that was an extra $50 billion dollars of, of grocery moved online last year alone. And so I think the next three, five, you know, whatever number of years, uh, just another few percentage points of it moving online. I mean, it's nearly a healthcare sized industry, right? Yeah. And so every percentage point that moves is just a massive decabillion dollar opportunity. And, and whether it's wineries, retailers, or grocery stores, just think of how much you know, I'm not saying go start a grocery store chain. No, but like think of the enabling technology or the web technology or the customer acquisitions that people, these stores are now going to need to do because none of them were prepared to go online. That's fantastic. For the folks listening, a lot of them are entrepreneurs. What's one thing you've learned as an entrepreneur that maybe isn't obvious, 
that folks, folks could take with them? Any bit of advice? So the, f- so the first few words will sound so obvious, but I think if I give some context, less so. Um, so I'm basically going to say, trust your gut, but you have to build enough expertise that your gut tells you roughly the right thing. And if I think back through, you know, leaving business school, working for someone else, starting a company, the second time round, raising institutional VC money, you know, learning how to manage managers, learning how to manage executives, you know, easy enough, maybe now after 20 years, 15 years, I get to say, trust your gut, but maybe I have 40,000 hours of doing this type of work. Um, But generally, uh, earlier on, when I knew I didn't know the answer, I would ask one person that I thought was really smart, and I would basically do the thing they said. And what I've learned since then is they don't know either, right? Like you don't know, but they don't know either. And many people play the game one time, right? Or even the people who play the VCs or whoever who play the game 10 times or 100 times, they don't know your business, uh, at least not like you do. And, and so I think if there's a skill, and there's, there's no shortcut to this, but if there's a skill I've learned is how to ask lots of people the question and then how to synthesize my answer from it. And sometimes that means I ignore them. And sometimes it means I, you know, smush three ideas together. Um, but, but, and it is cheesy, right? But like, if your gut tells you it's wrong, it probably is. And then what's really difficult is learning how to identify what's wrong about that thing. Right. And so you do ultimately have to trust your gut. Nobody will know your business or care about your business to the degree that you do as a founder. Um, And then the challenge is, you know, can you get smart enough around the things you need to be fast enough, you know, before you run out of time or willpower or sanity? Thank you for coming on today. I really appreciate it. It's great to see you. Mark. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wow, what a story and incredible advice. I'm very grateful to Philip for taking the time to be on the show. I hope you found it as fascinating as I did. Philip's advice about trusting yourself and believing in what you're doing is easier said than done, but it's a requirement to be successful as a founder. If you liked what you heard, please look us up with a like or a five-star review, and feel free to share with a friend. You can find me on Twitter at MPD, To hear more of my conversations with innovators, subscribe on YouTube, Facebook, or any other major podcast platform. Just search for innovation with Mark Peter Davis.